Let's go! Ha! Glad you are here. Who, me? Remember what I told you about Thor's hammer? Huh. Yes? All right, listen, and, and pay close attention now. Huh? Right, here we go now. <laughs> pay close attention. Right then, you see it now? It's a phallus, a fertility symbol. Case closed. Uh, the fuck's a phallus? It, it's a, a penis, a, a dick, a one-eyed snake, a trousers noodle. Oh, yes, a dick. <laughs> I have one. Congratulations. And it still works. What? My dick still works. But you are a ghost. Oh, yes, but on special occasions and times of the year, I can take physical form again. And what do you think I'll be using my physical form for, eh? Oh, but which specific times of the year? Uh, every full moon. That isn't much in a whole year. I uh, still have more sex than you. <laughs> Hello, my dear friends. How is it going? I'm Marty Thurger, and today here I am to talk a little bit about the celebration of Yol. I don't think I'm going to say anything new because almost every year I do at least one video about Yule. So I have talked about this subject quite a lot in the past. You see, uh, it's really more like a tradition by now. I am launching this video on the 21st of December on a Wednesday, 2022. All of my videos come out on Wednesdays. But today marks six years since I've become a YouTuber. Six years ago, in 2016, I've presented myself to you, officially starting this project of making videos in this platform, and it was also on the 21st of December, Wednesday, and precisely starting with a video about Yol, uh, where I've also introduced, for the very first time, Mr. Thorstein. Ulrich <laughs> Thorstein! <laughs> <laughs> so, today it's more like a celebration. Celebrating with all of you and this community we have been creating here over the past six years. Uh, it's good to have you all here. Uh, there's been a lot of love and friendship and I am thankful for that because it made me see humanity from a totally different perspective and it has frankly given me hope. All thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you, my dear friends. Now. Keeping up with the tradition, let's talk a little bit about Yol again. <laughs> Just a general view to avoid repeating myself concerning, well, uh, this subject and this entire theme. Yol, the pagan Norse festival or celebration celebrated during the winter solstice in Scandinavia. But was it really <laughs> a, a solstice celebration? Well, yes and no. It depends on the historical period we are dealing with. Uh, not all pre-Christian celebrations would be in relation to the solstices and equinoxes and also not always focused on fertility cults. Uh, I remind you about what I have expressed on um, a previous video back in 2020 uh, concerning the, this celebration. In the middle of winter, there was a sacrifice, a blot, uh, for a good crop in the coming year. This is Yule. Yule has become one of the most famous celebratory events for neo-pagans nowadays, mostly because the great majority of us was born and raised in a Christian context, and we have been used to celebrate Christmas. So, as pagans now, um, it's a chance to combine all festivities of this time and we can all get along. So there's this collective acceptance that Yule and Christmas are more or less in the same time period. Only Yule uh, seemingly being earlier on the winter solstice. But it isn't that simple and bringing Yule to the winter solstice was actually due to Christian influences. Changing the perception of pagan populations towards winter by marking the beginning of winter in the northern hemisphere, of course, on the 21st of December to get closer to the Christian celebration. Meaning, the 21st of December might be understood as the winter solstice and the official beginning of winter. However, the perceptive reality of animistic cultures towards the cognitive landscape was different and the beginning of winter was understood to be when the climate and landscape shows its first changes towards a 
darker season towards the temporal and space reality that shows the beginning of lower temperatures and the changing of behaviors of the living beings throughout the natural landscape. Yule was considered a mid-winter celebration. Therefore, if in pre-Christian times it was celebrated on the winter solstice, it would have instead been considered the first celebration of winter or at the very least a celebration of early winter, but it wasn't. For the case we are dealing with here today, uh, for all Norse people, winter didn't begin in the winter solstice at the 21st of December, but it began at the last full moon of the autumn equinox. Um, there was the no autumn uh, to the old Norse people. Our sense of autumn right now, uh, these days, nowadays, <laughs> uh, to them was uh, the beginning of winter marked by other celebrations. But it was King Okon the I of Norway, the third king of Norway and ruling in the 10th century, who began to force the heathens into Christianity. So it was he, King Okon, who moved Yule to the same date as Christmas, which was then held on the solstice on the Julian candle calendar, and we shall get to that in a moment. Uh, the actual pre-Christian heathen Yule was a three-day holiday, and that much more or less remained the same, but it began on a full moon, not on a fixed solar date. However, according to some sources, the Yule celebration constituted a rite that lasted 13 days and was of fundamental importance for the Nordic regions during the, the winter time. Uh, the winter time, the, the winter season, particularly harsh and long, where life was supposed to be symbolically renewed. Ceremonial rites involved the immolation of animals, fattened for this purpose, offered to this or or to the to the fertility fecundity deities and other entities, uh, for instance the Disir and or the Alfar, the Disir being female supernatural entities and the Alfar elves, both ancestors and inhabitants of the burial mounds, how dwellers and also earth spirit entities, therefore creating a celebration that involves contact between human communities and the communities of other persons of the world, inhabitants of the natural world, whose existence is closely linked to the earth and its fertility, which human beings needed to survive. So, from an animistic point of view, these celebrations are a focus on the relationships that are established between people within the environment in which they live. Mutual aid is fundamental to be created for the benefit of the populations that live in these natural environments. And yes, Yol was reclaimed by Christianity and replaced by Noel. Uh, the, the contemporary Christmas tree <laughs> dates back to the so-called Jolgran in Swedish, the, the Yule pine Norwegian Jolletre, uh, whose origin would be the, the cosmic tree Yggdrasil, uh, a symbol of life and fertility and the, uh, an animistic symbol that integrates and unites the populations of persons who live in the world, be they animals, humans and the others. In the Christmas tradition, the contemporary, in contemporary Nordic countries, the goats <laughs> remote to a pagan past as well and would refer to the god Thor, the tree to Odin, the boar to Freyr, Yol was also a great sacrificial feast of the dead or of the clan towards the dead and the ancestral peoples of the clan. Uh, the feast that traditionally takes place on this occasion was intended to also create bonds between the living and the dead, the ancestors, some of whom became elves, Althar, uh, being inhabitants of the areas where they were buried, thus becoming different beings transformed by death and providing soil fertility. Also, at this time, the famous Til Ors Ok Fridar, for a, a fruitful year and for peace, would be celebrated, which was part of the prerogatives of the Old Norse king, the, the kingly figure. Now, taking into account the pre-Christian Yule celebration as a mid-winter celebration, 
midwinter is the time of the three full moons after the full moon that marked the beginning of winter and three full moons before the full moon that marks the beginning of summer. <laughs> Meaning that Yol was three full moons, three moon cycles after the harvest moon. The harvest moon being somewhere around September or October. So the celebrations were not in fixed days, but highly dependent on the cycles of the moon and the day of the full moon. So midwinter, the heathen Yule, was not halfway between the equinoxes on a fixed day of a solstice. By the phases of the moon, it was in January. In fact, uh, one of the oldest evidences we have for a Scandinavian Yule celebration is a Byzantine source from the 6th century of the Common Era, um, making a reference to a celebration of midwinter by the Scandinavians after the winter solstice, after the winter solstice. So, not before, not during the winter solstice, as we normally do nowadays in neo-pagan religious manifestations, but <laughs> after the winter solstice. Three full moons after the harvest moon. Uh, don't be disheartened. Um, I too, and I must admit, I was convinced uh, many, some years ago that Yule was at the 21st of December because it was pushed to be, to be so since the, the, the 10th century, and the neo-pagan religions reinforced that. Uh, it's a good example of, well, not questioning something that is deemed to be common knowledge, and it, it has always been like that, but then when we are presented with evidences that point to the truth, or as close to the truth as possible, it is rather foolish to hold on to something incorrect. So, as I said, and it is important to underline, Haakon the Good, or Haakon the First of Norway, um, in the mid-10th century, moved the heathen Yule, the pre Haakon Yule, uh, to be at the same time as Christmas, which was by the time understood to be the solstice. Mind that Christmas was on the solstice until the Julian calendar was rectified by the Gregorian calendar six centuries after Alcon's time in the 16th century. So Alcon I of Norway moved Yule to the same date as Christmas. He was moving it to the solstice, the same date Christians celebrated Christmas at that time. And this is very important because from that moment onwards, the Scandinavian calendars start to have Yule on the solstice, especially Icelandic calendars thereafter. Uh, the Icelandic calendar after Christianization uh, shows clear differences from the celebrations held in continental Scandinavia in pre-Christian times. Because Haakon I moved Yule to the solstice, Therefore, in Iceland, or in Icelandic calendars from the 10th century onwards, we have Yule at the winter solstice. So, the actual pre-Christian Yule feast, or pre oaken Yule feast, occurred at the, the first full moon after the first new moon following the winter solstice. Which means Yule this year, 2022, will not be in 2022, but it will be in the 6th of January. Uh, if I'm making my calculations right, because... The first new moon after the winter solstice this year is at the 23rd of December, and the first full moon after this is the 6th of January. So, in hidden times in Scandinavia, we have both the pre Aukon Yule that followed the moon calendar, and we have the post Aukon Yule at the winter solstice following the Christian celebration of the period. These changes are important to take into consideration because uh, it has changed the days of celebrations, uh, not just on the, the calendar, but the amount of days of the celebration itself and the religious motifs have changed and religious syncretism played an important role in these changes and in the celebratory motifs and meanings, which is why at some point, it gets confusing to try to understand the moment of celebration of the Alphablot, the sacrifice to the elves, because this specific celebration also took place on Yule, or rather, 
sacrifices to the Disir and the Alfar also took place, were also performed or held in this time period of, the, of this celebration. The Yol celebration in this sense is also called Disablut and or Alfablut, but these two celebrations have become separated celebrations on their own as well and on other time periods of the year in different calendars, in different periods, especially on the post Okun and post-Christian Icelandic calendars. The very confusing and contradictory dates for these celebrations is precisely due to the changes of dates and religious understandings spoken here before. Sometimes people tend to forget the tremendous impact of Christianity upon pagan religiosities and belief systems and the impact on the perceptive reality of pagan populations. But not just that. Christianity didn't occur in one day and everything changed. It's not like we have a specific point marked on a date that shows us that before this point everyone was pagan and after that point everything turned Christian and down to hell. Christianization in the north was a long process. The Christianization of Scandinavia was neither an immediate nor a uniform process. The instituted Christianity in any place that wasn't Christian before was intertwined with local religious conceptions prior to its arrival. In the Nordic lands, the medieval Nordic religion would not be exclusively Christian nor heathen, but hybrid, woven between clerical, political and ancient traditional discourses. Before King Okun, Christianity was already known in Denmark at least since the 6th century. During the so-called Viking period, there were Scandinavians who were baptized. And Christianity was known in the north before King Okun and practiced and mixed with heathen conceptual religious elements as evidenced by 9th and 10th century grave material culture, grave goods, and Christianity influenced the physical evidences of Thor's hammer, among other religious and cultural elements. So, it isn't strange that the dates for these celebrations are not consistent in several sources, because they were changed according to political, religious and cultural factors, and even due to the change of people's lifestyles, the different economic and geographic and temporal changes and realities, and even different on a regional level, a local level. The festival of Yule was essentially religious and sacrificial in character, and it seems to have been mainly towards fertility, but also Odin, the god Odin, would be associated with Yule, having the epithet of Jornir. In fact, in the celebration of Yol, we see it connected to Odin, Thor and Freyr. There seems to have been different celebratory motifs, not just towards fertility, but death as well. Renewal, the fertility and renewal provided by both nature and the entities that in there inhabit, such as the elves, the ancestors, the ancestral dead and other land spirits. However, the association between the worship of the dead and ancestor veneration during Yol is uncertain. <laughs> Perhaps still an allusion from the winter sacrifices during the European Bronze Age. Christian Icelandic sources describe pagan Yule in terms of the Christian celebrations they knew in a Christian perspective. Especially in the sagas, the Yule would be the Yule celebration would be a, a time for Draugar activity. The Draugar is an undead that comes to life after being buried in a burial mound and it is, com it is a common theme in Icelandic sagas. In medieval Iceland it is well noted this growth of fear in relation to the dead returning from their graves, especially at auspicious times of the year that remote from or to pagan celebrations and pagan concepts. To achieve the definitive death of Adraur, the restless dead, it would be necessary to cut off its head and burn the body. Note it down. In 
Snorre. Sturluson, the pagan festival, is understood completely as the winter solstice sacrifice, which contains the communal feast. Here we already see the Christian religious understanding. On the other hand, some Old Norse sources do not generalize Yule as a communal feast at all, but describe it as a ritual limited to certain families or certain family members and selected members of the community presided over by a woman. So, completely different. The sources are not consistent when it comes to the dates and the religious motives and meanings of these celebrations, because we are in the presence of, as I said, changes in the mentalities of these populations over the centuries and the influences on their perceptive reality and on the conceptions that formulated the cognitive landscape due to the progressive religious and cultural motifs and belief systems that were being adopted, adapted, formulated, reformulated and altered. But I think we are focusing too much on dates and the, and the calendars. For an academic perspective, surely, obviously, it is important to know the truth and the evolution of these celebrations. Although, the more we focus on the dates and giving importance to the time of celebration, for us, pagans and animists, I think we lose the sense and meaning of it altogether. I mean... It is to be expected. After all, we have been living in societies which have progressively been constructing a low sense of self-control as part of the collective consciousness of the populations of our modern era, precisely to give way for authoritarian and oppressive religions and regimes to thrive. So, for us pagans, for what good is the knowledge of the proper dates of celebrations if we don't know the origins of such celebrations, the meanings, why such celebrations have been created in the first place, and for which purpose? Why are we doing it? The whole purpose of celebrations are lost, and we simply focus on the dates, because it seems we were not fully content with the sun and the moon alone and the passing of the seasons. And so we had to divide time in years, months, weeks and days going down to the detail of hours and minutes and seconds. <laughs> Structuring our way through life afraid of losing count of time because in our own low sense of self-control we need structures to guide us through life because we are really just children who have to be told what to do. It's absolutely maddening, and in our fervent need to create a linear time, we have given ourselves the curse of being too aware of our time on this earth and our existence, as if there is nothing else but a race towards the inevitable end. <laughs> we are losing the sense of it altogether which is why we rarely appreciate moments in life. As I have said on a, on a previous video, uh, as a possible interpretation from an animistic mindset or worldview, seasonal festivals and celebrations are important rituals as a tool of communication through which a relationship can be created. Celebrations that took place at specific times of the year which is a type of phenomenon extremely relevant in the life of peoples of antiquity. It marks times of change, and such change often brings about an unknown outcome, which may be beneficial or harmful, but we don't know yet. So it is important to celebrate the moment before the great change, because in the present, the only certainty is that we are here, right now, and we have to take the best of it. Seasonal festivities were organized rituals which allowed communication with the supernatural sphere and to renew relationships with that same supernatural reality. That is, it was an important aspect for the understanding of these peoples and for the maintenance of the interaction with the other world, the seen and the unseen. The same way the, the seasons 
changed and there was the necessity to accompany the renewal of the natural world, it was also important to renew the relationships with the natural world. Renew, build or maintain relationships between humans but also between among and towards the others. It's, it's not just about human communities but the wider community. The seasonal changes comes for us all, for us of a particular community, to other humans, animals and other persons of the world. When we deal with pre-Christian cultures, we must not forget that these societies, in religious terms, were animistic. In an animistic worldview, the interaction with the world around us and the supernatural forces that govern and interact with natural forces and with the human being, it was important to maintain this connection, maintain a balance, build a beneficial relationship with the non-human entities or beings for the well-being of the general community, the community as a whole. So seasonal celebrations helped to consolidate these relationships and to renew these relationships for the coming year, for the coming life, new life. A series of practical behaviors towards local deities and other entities of place, especially spirits of weather, of the grain and of the soils that would help in the growth and production of means of sustenance. So through a symbiotic relationship with such entities, it required the offering of something, the sacrifice of something to renew the relationship with such entities to keep having support in the next cycle of food production. Maintaining and honoring such relationships through which means of survival can be established. These celebrations are nothing more than rituals. Rituals are symbolic representations. They are moments through which human beings and supernatural deities and entities can meet and therefore rituals are essential elements for the communication process between the two realities or multiple realities and to obtain greater effectiveness in life, in everyday life. That is why the ritual presents precisely the attempt to build, maintain and renew all the relationships on which humans depended on for survival. Times may change, but I think it is proper to celebrate and honor the persons and factors that help us to survive and thrive in life. Without a, a, a symbiotic relationship of mutual respect towards nature and its persons, there's little that truly helps us to survive and to live and to extend our ex existence as much as possible, an existence with meaning. It is that meaning that must be celebrated, I think. And through ritual expressed in these yearly celebrations, we demonstrate the respect, honor and appreciation we have for all those who help us to survive and to be alive the celebration of life and moments of change. Thank you so much for watching, <laughs> my dear friends, and thank you for being in there. See you on next video. As always, tak for Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell.